super. Let's see if this works. Can you all hear me in the back? Then you didn't sit far enough away. <laughs> Let's see if I get this volume okay? So I can speak like this and you're all good? Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that extraordinary introduction. Uh, uh, so now, since most of you have no idea who I am, I'll quickly tell you. Uh, I'm Hugh Hallman. I'm the former mayor of the city of Tempe. Uh, there are reasons that I'm the former mayor, the greatest one of which is I'm fairly obnoxious and disliked, and so therefore I'm now really literally unelectable to any office. Uh, I, I identify with the work you do because uh, I am an economist first by training. Uh, with an accounting minor. I'm a numbers guy, a little bit autistic, so that I, I don't uh, carry on very well with human beings, but if you give me a computer or a calculator, 10 key, I'm in heaven. Uh, I then went on, uh, so first an economist, then went on to go to law school at a place called the University of Chicago, which is heavy in finance and economics. And I did that because, again, I didn't have to talk to people, I could look at spreadsheets. And then finally, I did ultimately go into politics, uh, and my first effort was for a presidential campaign that was successful in 1984. Uh, you can do the math to figure out who that was. And I continued to get involved because I'm passionate about my country, I'm passionate about my state. My family has been in this state since 1867. But that tells you why there's a little intellectual problem in the family. These are people who came here and didn't go another hundred miles to where there was water and grass. And they decided to raise cattle on rocks. So that's my lineage. But think about it. You're now speaking, to, uh, talking with an economist, which is a pretty lowly career to start with. Then I became a lawyer and then politician. So I'm a three-time loser, uh, but how bad is your life? You're actually listening to me, so that's, uh, that's I think, sets this up. I was asked to talk about the government property lease excise tax, uh, which is a fairly dull... Um, boy, you're going to worry about that. I'm going to trip over it, pull everything off the table. Don't worry about it. It is what it is. Um, here, I can, see, I can even dance. So. Uh, that's the real reason that I'm here, is because they wanted somebody who could talk about a really dull subject and yet maybe have a shot at keeping you awake. So there'll be a few tricks and other things like that. Government property lease excise tax, what, how, and why? Um, you're all sitting in a building that is, uh, was paid for by taxpayers. These kinds of things don't get easily done in the private market, we'll talk about that, but that is effectively the genesis of the government property lease excise tax. And what I need to start with is the most important issue. <laughs> How it's pronounced. <laughs> it is giblet. Anybody in this room who pronounces it giblet, get out now. Just get out now. Uh, that is honestly the most important thing. You can tell which side of the issue somebody's on, because if they pronounce it giblet, they're for it. If they pronounce it giblet, they have concerns. So you can already tell where I start the universe, because I pronounce it giblet, uh, just like you know when we're making Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, here's how this thing started. What is giblet? How many of you know much about it at all? How many of you are stuck in the arcane business of property tax and having to deal with giblets? Okay, there it is. For the rest of you, then, I'll tell you stuff that they already know, and I'm sorry if I'm going to bore them. Oh, this really is fabulous. I'm going to take the tape off so it doesn't stick to my legs. Um, and uh, now I'm stuck on this piece. I thought politics was sticky. Okay. Uh, we had, before 1996, a possessory interest tax, and it was the means by which government property that was leased could collect revenue associated with it, and it ultimately was declared unconstitutional. So the legislature and other folks came together and said, how do we fix this problem so we still have a revenue stream associated with property that's leased, owned by the government and leased, and address the genius of Patrick Flynn. Who knows who Patrick Flynn is? Yeah, I didn't think so. Patrick Flynn was a CFO of the city of Tempe. And he created the very first giblet before there was a giblet with DMB. Y'all know DMB. They're the great big developer that was started by a Campbell Soup Ale. And DMB builds buildings all over the, the, the state and other places. Uh, it's effectively you know, responsible for Verado. But its very first project was in Tempe at the corner of Mill Avenue and University on the south or on the northwest corner where the movie theater is and the P.F. Chang's. 
Patrick Flynn, our CFO, realized that if the city of Tempe took title to their property, they could then charge a lease fee. That fee would come to the city of Tempe, and then the city could take it out of this pocket and hand it back to the developer. Well, why bother doing that if you're in a regime in which you don't have tax? What really kicked this thing off was not about how you build buildings at taxpayer expense kind of stuff. It was how do you as a landlord get to charge your tenants for taxes and fees under the, the common area maintenance, the CAM charges, those kind of concepts? Collect that money, pay it to the government that's charging you that, and then have them give it back to you. The tenants were paying these fees, and DMB then could aggregate that money and use it for its purposes, including its own bottom line. Now, I'm a capitalist here, so let's be very clear. Very clever scheme, and Patrick Flynn put that in place, and that was part of what drove the need to put a giblet statute in place, was to preclude cities from turning that into a cottage industry and generating lots of money for the cities and their developer friends at the expense of other beneficiaries of property tax primarily school districts. That's, that's ultimately the biggest beneficiary of our property tax system are the school districts. So cities have this great incentive to take property tax that would otherwise go to somebody else and slide it off into the city's pocket. If they have to share some of it with the developer, so be it. But that's the price of doing business and that's how this all got started. Well, the Giplet in 1996 was passed to allow a, uh, a government entity, and most of these have been done by cities, to take title to the property that was otherwise in the private sector and subject to property tax, put it on the city's rolls, which makes it not taxable, and then impose a fee, the government property lease excise tax, on leasing it back to the developer. I confuse real estate people sometimes, but I call it bald title. A city takes a deed from the developer for the buildings and the land underneath the buildings and then turns around and leases every single basket of rights one could possibly convey to somebody without handing them back the title. So the leases that get put in place give all of the rights back to the developer, and the city only holds bald title. It's title in nearly name only. That came up in an important way this year for the city of Tempe on a property that I'll tell you about. So what happens is the cities take title, and everybody's happy. But now we have three versions of this, which is causing some significant confusion. We have a 1996 version where there are deals still out there <coughs> under that regime. The Hyatt Regency Hotel in downtown Phoenix is probably the finest example. By 2010, enough sort of angst and dram had gone about, including the Goldwater Institute and the Free Enterprise Club and others, and people like me. I testified at the legislature back in 2004 that the government property lease excise tax was being terribly abused. It's one of the reasons I ran for office in the first place, because there were two cities, primarily only two cities, that used this, the city of Phoenix and the city of Tempe. And over time, as happens when there's money available, the folks who glom on to money, like barnacles on a ship, surrounded it and came up with all kinds of ways in which that money could be distributed to them. And so the patterns of development, I'll at least just speak about Tempe because of my work in there, the patterns of development got to the point that by the mid-90s, uh, late 90s, you had all kinds of tax being scraped off in ways that I didn't think were actually delivering what the giblet was intended. But what it was intended to do was to give you a tax scheme where there was tax coming in on government property and then it would be distributed to our various districts. The feature of the giblet that was put in place to stop the Patrick Flynn 15 year abatement of fees was that there would be a cap of eight years. So under the 1996 structure, the city takes bald title, gives back a lease, and then, at that time, an unlimited number of years in which you got to have this fee imposed instead of property tax. At the time it was originally put in place, the schedule, it was a fixed schedule for what fees would be charged, were about 80-90% of the property tax values. But the eight-year abatement 
getting the money back for eight years into the developer's pocket was a pretty big number in many cases. There are three uh, major buildings now on downtown Tempe's Lake, not the new ones that are State Farm, but farther to the uh, west are three towers that were built under that giblet regime. It was passed in 1999. A lawyer, very famous lawyer, his father has a building named after him in Tempe, got his client the government property lease excise tax and the net present value of that, I'm in a room full of people, I don't have to explain what that is, net present value of that was $26.8 million. Arizona Mills Mall, and this is the one that put me over the edge, got a property tax abatement using the giblet. That was almost exactly the same number. It had two numbers switched. It was $28.6 million. And that put me over the edge for this reason. Of course the city of Tempe needed to subsidize the development of that mall. Because who in their right mind would take 180 acres on the convergence of two of the busiest freeways in the state and build them all for crying out loud? Nobody in their right mind would do that. And I thought, what are we doing? We're handing somebody an extra net present value of 28.6 to put a mall in Tempe. When they would have done that on their own, and now the tax base has lost that money, and that's just net present value. I thought that was absurd. So that's how I ended up in Tempe politics and local politics. I ran for council saying, we've got to stop doing this stuff. Friendly kind of deals like this don't make sense. That was the 96 regime, and of course, the extra great thing about it is if you started out with a tax base of 90% of property tax after the abatement, every 10 years, it was reduced by 20%. So by year 50, it's zero. Go take a look at what the uh, property tax or the giblet uh, government lease excise tax payments are on the Hyatt Regency Hotel. And the losers to that are these, because it's now so old that it's near zero. That's a huge value when you're trying to build something and entice investors to give you money, and ultimately when you sell it. Appraisers out there, many of you are in the appraisal business, Appraisers out there are in the cottage industry of appraising the values of giblets. Well, if they're necessary for a deal, why do we have appraisers out there appraising them? And I'll explain that. The 2010 deal, the legislature carved back and put a limited life on it at 25 years. Still the same year abatement and a new schedule. The interesting thing was, folks got smart, and in addition to putting in a new schedule, which had not been replaced since 1996, think about the inflationary impact on a schedule that was in place from 1996 and continued in place until 2010. You all know how to do that math. The value of the dollar in those schedules over time was eroded to more than less than half of that. They added an inflator in it. So the schedule gets enhanced every year on a rolling two-year basis using the producer price index. That's pretty good. They also restricted the areas that giblets can be offered to this little formula, which is no more than 5% of your total land and no more than 640 acres, whichever is smaller, effectively. The city of Phoenix is 400 some odd square miles. You can imagine the size of a giblet district if 5% of their property could be utilized. Then they added some procedural things, and that's what most of you probably now really getting familiar with because the process got reversed in 17. You had a 60-day notice and all these kind of recordings, but there were so many problems discovered in the 2010 uh, operation that ultimately we have a 2017 version. And this version finally eliminated the tail. What do I mean by the tail? In the old days, you got an eight-year abatement and then unlimited numbers of years at a reduced property tax cost, a giblet tax cost. That has a value to it. We used to call that the tail. The 2010 version cut the tail short to 25 years. So you have an eight-year abatement period, and then years 9 through 25 are at the giblet rate. Yes, it's got an inflator in it, but it's still lower than the property tax costs otherwise would be, and that has a value. The new one said, no more tail even for the years 9 to 25. Beginning January of 2017, you can still give away eight years of property tax, but you can't give away a tail. Now you go back onto the property tax system after eight years. Then 
You've now got government entities that have to calculate that, have to report it, put it up on websites so that the public has greater access to what's going on in these funds. So have I bored you completely yet? That's how it works in a slot. Government takes property, they lease it back, they then subject it to the excise tax, and for at least eight or up to eight years, they give the money back to the developer. That's really how it works. Why do we have it? The state of Arizona likes to hold itself out as fairly fiscally conservative, and in this instance, there are 49 states that have TIFs, tax increment financing, where a district gets formed and the additional revenues that come into that district after somebody does some special stuff gets to be scraped off and put back into the investment in that district. Effectively this. Our TIF was limited for this building for rental car tax and hotel tax, but that's effectively it. Is that this thing would have such an impact that it would generate additional revenues and we'll just take those revenues and use it to build a building. Arizona is the only state that doesn't have it. Whenever anybody uh, here presenting on these things talks about a redevelopment tool, that means they also pronounce it G-plet. <laughs> the use of the words redevelopment tool are always my indicator that this is somebody who likes this stuff. It's not that I hate it, because you'll see that in a minute, it's that I'm very cynical when people come to me and make these arguments. They say, we can't build this project because there's a financial gap. The money we could make building a flat building out in Gilbert on old farmland that's clean would give us X, and this infill project in the city of Tempe would give us X minus. And we can't get investors unless we can give them X, so you've got to help us fill that gap. There's the gap argument. So imagine a hearing that goes on for two hours where a lawyer is arguing that his client should get $26.8 million in government property lease excise tax abatements net present value. And there's some jackass on the dais that says, yes, sir, I won't use his name if I can help it. Yes, sir, I understand that point, but you say that the gap is caused because when you go out on the street to market these office leases, you're only going to be able to get $16 a square foot. Well, that's right. And because we can only get $16 a square foot on, in Tempe on Town Lake that costs the taxpayers $240 million, we have to make that up for investors. Very good, Mr. X. Uh, but here's off the website your real estate broker advertising your project to pre-lease. And the minimum rent is $24 a square foot. Well, um, you know, we don't know what it's really going to be. How about this, Mr. Developer's Lawyer? We'll give you the full giblet if you only get $14 a foot. You'll get no giblet if you get $24 a foot, and we'll create a schedule in between to how we're going to divide that up. How do you like that? Yes, Mr. Hallman, you're a jackass, but <laughs> your only choice is to vote yes or no. Yes, Mr. X, I understand that, but please answer my question. That's why I got so cynical about this stuff, and I think you all ought to be cynical, and you're in the business where you can use that cynicism to hold people accountable to deliver good stuff for our communities. The entitlement process, if any of you have ever done development, go into a city and try to get through the process effectively and efficiently. It's really hard and very expensive. And the great things for people like me, as a lawyer, is as cities make it harder and harder, I get paid more and more and more. I have no incentive to help solve those problems. I have an incentive to help them. Well, that's a joke. But there are people who market themselves as the experts in town A or town B or town C precisely because these systems are so arcane and difficult that the average person can't come off the street and engage with his or her government to get something done. You've got to pay somebody a bunch of money to help you through all of these crazy systems. And as a result, there is an argument that made the entitlement process a problem. Environmental cleanup. Tempe Marketplace. You all know Tempe Marketplace? Please say yes. You've all been there. You've shopped, spent lots of money. <laughs> okay. Um, Tempe Marketplace is an old county island. I was on the city council in 1988-89, or 1998-99-2000 when we took that county island and annexed it. It was a ton of work because the owners of that property were properly cynical that if they come into the city they're going to get whipsawed by the city and we had to create all kinds of special programs and stuff. 
And they were worried that they would get squeezed out, that the city would use eminent domain to kick them off their property. In 2002, I left the council. Many, many people on my council were happy about that. <laughs> Two years later, however, I'd suddenly become the mayor of the city. And we are now in the middle of this massive fight, lawsuits filed by 13 different property owners in the Tempe Marketplace area because the city indeed had used, decided to use eminent domain. That was the last vote that the council took before my swearing in, and they did it in a big hurry because they knew that I would never use eminent domain. And the developer and everybody had cut all the deals, and they needed to have that power in order to get the marketplace put together. You want a side story that's kind of, I think it's interesting? Yeah. So here's a side story. I'm not even yet sworn at, or sworn in, um, <laughs> on, on July, it was like the 28th. It was the last day possible. I can't imagine why my predecessor didn't want me to become mayor, but there it is. So I was elected in the primary in March and not sworn, at, sworn in until the end of July. A four month period, the longest it's ever happened in our city. But in that period of time, people who knew I was the mayor of elect, elect it, this is a guy who's gonna be making the decision, we better at least say hello. And the people who most wanted to say hello to me were the owners of the property in the Tempe Marketplace, 13 property owners, and the developer assembling it. I still know most of those people and are friends with them. Because what happened is, I'm not yet the mayor of the city, I invite them to my law office, they're all sitting around my conference table, the developer comes and I say, you know, you all need to meet one another. Now you, Mr. Assembler, get out of my offices, because I'm going to talk to these people. And I said, tell me everything that your issues are, and let's talk about it. And we spent a couple hours together, made a list of all their needs. And the answer was, so if I can get these things for you, you actually want to sell. Well, who wouldn't want to sell property that had been trading at $2 a foot that was contaminated and was in a nightmare stage? Buildings that had never been inspected that were falling down, dangerous conditions, all this kind of stuff. And you're the property owner who's now completely liable for all of that. Now instead, you're being offered a deal that says, if you sell at four or eight or nine dollars a foot, depending on your property, you're gonna be let off the hook for all the environmental problems, everything. You're gonna get complete indemnity. Why? Because the city is already stuck with that. You all know this. These property owners could never have afforded to clean up the messes. They'd have walked away, the, the federal government would have come in sued if they want to, but all the federal government's going to get from these people is this property. That's all messed up. So we already had the reality of the cleanup was going to be on the taxpayer at some point. So the goal was not to incentivize these people to take more than they should, but to get them to sell consensually. At the end of that two-hour meeting of 13 property owners, 11 of them said, get me that deal. I had that deal cut effectively by the end of the day. That left us with two people. One of the guys said, um, I just can't do this. Well, he'd gone on the front page of the Tribune newspapers when it existed and explained why he was being ripped off and this was all horrible and everybody's bad. He wanted to deal just like everybody else. In fact, he'd already bought property someplace else to move his business. But he couldn't face the uh, humiliation of turning around and doing a deal. That's a problem. The other guy is an old guy who was completely retired and a mechanic and his wife just liked him out of the house. So he literally went to this place with dirt where he used to tinker with cars. He called me from home and he said, my wife has convinced me it's time to sell. Can you give me that deal? So we had 12 deals cut before the end of the day. Now we had one piece of litigation. That lawyer then went around and tried to ingen uh, 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 generate some heat for his other guy saying, you're selling out too little. So I actually ended up with three lawsuits that continue. I'm now sworn at, sworn in, and I sit down, have I used that joke too much? Because <laughs> uh, I think of it that way. I s went with our city attorney, because I'm only the mayor. I may be a lawyer, but I only played it on TV at that time, our city attorney. <laughs> so I could meet with the lawyers, because I'm now the client, and the other lawyers can't meet with me without my legal representation. And we got three more deals done in about three weeks. And here's how. Gee, Mr. Lawyer, who's an eminent domain guy, makes all this money this way, saying that the city is ripping us off, and what you're really about is getting more money for your client. It's the old joke. We know what you are. We're just dickering over the price. The three lawyers who were left, they were there doing their job to get as much money as they could for their clients using every brick bat they could to beat the heck out of the city. And I just had these conversations. 
You know my reputation. I don't use eminent domain for these kinds of things. Bailey's break shop tells us you can't use eminent domain to take property from one person and give it to somebody else for private use. This is not for a school, it's not for a road, it's not for a sidewalk, it's not for a park. And I'm working diligently to get four votes. I've already got three votes, mine and two others. And when I get that fourth vote, we're going to reverse the action on eminent domain. Because I agree with you, your client should get to keep their properties. I think that's exactly the right outcome. You thought I'd kicked them in the well. Because <laughs> I can say that in good faith in all seriousness. We had those deals done in three weeks. We never actually had to go forward with the eminent domain actions, precisely because test your systems. If you're good to your policy and your word, you can generally convince people that you're crazy. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> Development cost land. So I just gave you those examples of why people come in and say, we love to do this, but we can't because of X. Well, in the case of the Tempe marketplace, it has a giblet that I support it. Because the city of Tempe was stuck with the environmental hazards, as was the federal government. Taxpayers were going to pay for it. So we got an insurance policy. We got an $8 million grant for cleanup from the federal government. And then the developer agreed to take on all the risks for all the cleanup. And we would put in a certain amount of money. It was The total input was about $38 million to do all that cleanup. It was less then we would have had to pay to take it over and have us do it, and instead the private sector took care of it much more effectively and efficiently. And that project opened in 2007 and makes Tempe big piles of money. And now all the stuff is back on the tax rolls and it's making everybody big piles of money. In fact, the project sold, you may have read about it just a couple of years ago, for a billion dollars. Now that was the package deal with two malls, including the one in the north side, same owner, but you know, a billion dollars is not a bad result. So that's why you get those questions. But here I am. Most of the property tax given away by municipalities is, of course, not municipal property tax, said Tempe Mayor Hugh Allman, a critic of giblet deals. So there is an incentive to use other people's money. I really would get rid of it all. I just see money going out the door, and we don't need to give it away. That's 2010, the Goldwater Institute, quoting me in their study on giblets and suing me at the same time. You can imagine how happy I was about that. And then here's 2017, same guy. Arizona cities have long used tax breaks to encourage business and real estate development. Many of these have been foolish, but when used properly, they have given taxpayers more than their money's worth. But you have to be able to articulate and understand that the answer is at zero or one. Most solutions in this universe are somewhere in between. It's 6.254 subprime 3XZ. I'm in politics. Folks have to know what my policies are, but I'll tell you, trying to explain how the Tempe marketplace deal works to the average voter who doesn't care, you either voted for it or you voted against it. You're either for giving away taxpayers' dollars or you're against it. That's part of why I'm unelectable, because I'm not a zero-one red-blue guy. I'm, what's the solution? You're all dealing with that kind of stuff on a daily basis. You've got this whole set of laws that you've got to abide by. You're given no discretion. But you know this outcome's wrong, how do we fix it? And you're looking on a daily basis for how you get a good outcome, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. And it's very hard. In these contexts, it's very tough too. So here's an example of why we need it. Who knows what that is? Oh, come on, some of you must be as old as I am. That is the footprint of Disneyland under construction, and that's Disneyland. Oh. Free rider problems is one of the best arguments an economist will make about why you need to give the developer some money. Walt Disney learned this in spades. He spent all of his money, put his house at risk, borrowed everything he could get to build Disneyland. He didn't have enough money to buy all the land around it. So other people, after Disneyland was a success, came in and took all this farmland and turned it into hotels and all kind of other great stuff and made big piles of money with no risk. That's a free rider problem. They get the benefits without the risks. So when a developer does something in some circumstances where they then generate a whole bunch of benefits for all of us that they can't capture, government is used to capture some of those benefits and overcome the risk. That makes complete sense. This is an example. Tempe Town Lake was the next example. 
my biggest fight with my then current mayor and another reason I ran for office. The city of Tempe ended up spending $244 million to build Town Lake. It was going to cost, in the original proposals, guess how much? $16 million. Oh, no, no, what I meant was $24 million. No, I meant 40, no, $44 million for the project, and then they stopped talking about the project and started just talking about the lake, because it was $44 million in bonds to do the two dams on either end and the cutoff walls. And another $200 million to do everything else. Why is that a free rider problem? Guess who owned all the land around Town Lake? Not the city of Tempe. We took all the risk, taxpayers paid all that money, and other people then got to make all the profits. This is what Walt Disney did the second time. You know what that is. Disney World. This is Disney World. Walt Disney sent somewhat more than 40 different real estate agents who didn't know one another, didn't know what they were doing, all to buy up pieces of property. And he bought up most of the county. So this time, he could invest his money in the middle of it and put all these little parks and things in, and then as it expanded, he would get the profits from that risk. Tempe Town Lake, my biggest argument was, folks, before you pull the trigger on this, you go buy up all that dirt. It's fair market value before you build. This is $2 a foot. It's cost afterward. Afterward, the city of Tempe, during my reign of terror, we sold uh, a 27-acre parcel with some challenges to it for $42.5 million. Do the math on the square feet because I can't remember. Um, and that included a scheme where we took only $8 million in down payment, secured the remaining debt with the land itself with an $8 million payment every single year plus interest at 8%. Now, that's the city going into business. That wasn't really why I was doing it. Because if the city collected all that money at once, my colleagues would have spent it. So the goal was to have it over time that we could then put it into sinking funds to take care of problems with the lake. And by securing the real estate, the debt with the real estate, if the developer didn't perform, guess what we'd get back? Our own dirt. That's right. When they finally tipped over in the 089 downturn, they lasted a little while longer. They'd spent $26 million putting in infrastructure plus having paid us $8 million, plus $8 million, $8 million, and $8 million. So we had $24 million bucks in our pocket, of, no, $32 million in our pocket, plus $26 million investment in the land. The city of Tempe ended up cutting a deal where we only got 60% of it back. Now, with all that infrastructure already in, government can behave sensibly and solve problems if it thinks about these kinds of issues. How do you avoid free rider problems and here's why we tax. We tax because we need the funds to do exactly these things. It's really hard for each of us to build a road. In the way, way, way early days of our country, there were lots of private roads and canals. But they didn't cover very much distance. Go to England, walk around England, you'll find that there are little six and five and eight mile railroads, abandoned now, that were built 100 years ago because that was going on. That kind of level of transportation infrastructure financing was being done by private people. Well, it's real hard to build the I-10, let alone the entire interstate system, with each of us negotiating with one another about who's going to put in the land and how much money and how you get it all back. So we use government to solve these collective action problems, police and fire. Most people, although there are still some in our country who are libertarian anarchists, would say you don't actually need to have a police force. You can actually privately arrange for all of that. And we actually have a mix of that. You've all been to Bank One Ballpark. It's got its own security people. Downtown Tempe has police officers and team folks. You know, there are all kinds of mixes of that, but mostly we do it because of this. And then moral hazard problems. Trying to avoid environmental problems up front. In a moral hazard problem is when I get to get all the benefits. It's the opposite of a free rider problem. I get all the benefits, and I get to impose some of the costs on you. In the old days, we knew those as the chimneys and smokestacks in Indiana. Massive belching of pollution that in, undermines other people's quality of life because of health problems, you know, does all that kind of stuff. You don't have to take it all the way to uh, uh, global warming. The point is, in that range, you've got moral hazard problems. Other people make money at our expense. And we use government to solve these kinds of problems. 
So that's how we end up in a system where you've got complexity and developers coming in on the private sector saying, I want to do a deal. So I then try to test all of these systems when somebody would come in. If the project doesn't receive the government property lease excise tax, it won't be built. I had Mr. Lawyer in 1999 explaining if they did not get this upcharge, nobody would ever finance it, and those three buildings would not get built. I get that. You're making your arguments, but I don't believe you. I certainly don't believe it about Arizona Mills Mall. I think I gave you that example. Tempe Town Lake it imposed extraordinary costs. That is to say that if you have your building on the town lake, you have to pay more costs for being there and you get no upside. That's a really weird thing for the private market to say when those same people were saying, City of Tempe, build this, it'll be great, and you'll make a lot of money. And then they come back in and say, oh, what we meant to say is, we can't actually afford to build on Town Lake because there's extra costs associated. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, we can't build underground parking garages because the, the lake will fill it full of water. So we gotta pay, it's that kind of stuff. You test all of those theses all along the way, uh, city's burden requires the offset because the city is so burdensome, et cetera, I've talked about that. Public parking, that's a great one. It's actually very useful. The city of Tempe did something. How many of you have last visited Mill Avenue? Who's been to Mill Avenue recently? Okay, what was the major number one complaint people would make about visiting Mill Avenue? Parking! Oh my God. Why? Why did that happen? It's because, believe it or not, one of the incentives given to developers uh, over 30 years ago was we'll relieve you from the obligation to build parking for your project if you'll just make an in-lieu payment for $7,500. And developers did that all day long because the actual, at that time, the cost of building structured parking was running about $12,000 a space. So they could make $4,500 by not building parking and Tempe ended up with this parking nightmare that we had to get ourselves back out of. And guess what happened to all that money going into the sinking fund for parking? Oh, gee, we spent it on other stuff. So getting developers to actually build public parking is a huge value. Some of that happened here. City of Phoenix needs parking. Well, the stadium needs a lot of parking, but only for short periods of time. A football stadium needs 26,000 parking spaces for 12 games a year. And then otherwise, it's flat dirt. It's the Cardinals, right? It's only 12 games a year. Um, <laughs> join Michael Bidwell. He wants me dead, too. Because um, I got to negotiate the deal with him. I'll tell you, if you ever want to hear that story. So the Tempe Stadium in downtown Tempe at Priest and Rio Salado on SRP property was going to get built there. I got to negotiate the deal, because my mayor at that time said, if you don't get through home, it's never going to get done anyway, so you might as well deal with them now. And by the end of that deal, the Cardinals were going to pay the city of Tempe $16.8 million for the pleasure of getting to put the stadium there. Then all this nonsense about aviation stuff. You all are sitting in a building. Guess how tall it is? 210 feet. Guess how far it is from the uh, west end of the north runway? Exactly the same distance as the proposed football stadium would have been in Tempe. Exactly the same distance. Exactly the same height. But in Tempe, people will be hurt, people will die. In Phoenix, it's open the, isn't that fun looking out and watching the aircraft? I kid you not, that's politics. That was about Phoenix getting a stadium built in downtown Phoenix on the railroad yard. Unfortunately, Skip Rims, it couldn't get it done. So it's now out in Glendale to a cost of another cost of about $200 million to, to Glendale taxpayers, plus the amount of money we put into the deal. All of that stuff is testing those things. And the Cardinals deal, we had to get 26,000 parking spaces. That's a pretty congested area. So we were out signing leases and cutting deals with the owners of all the buildings around that we would get the parking during game days. It all worked. You can monetize that. But it's expensive. When the parking spaces aren't used very much for long periods of time, there's a lot of good value that can come to the public. I'm stunned. I parked, I probably parked in the wrong parking garage, but it's the one across the street on the north side of Jefferson. How many of you parked there? You all walked, right? Yeah, okay. I had to park. Guess how much they're charging today? $12. Because it's an event. Apparently you guys draw such attention that the event was 12 bucks to come see me, and I'm the only one who paid the price. But I got into that parking garage, there are hundreds and hundreds of cars parked there at 12 bucks a head. That's impressive. 
that value coming back to the city of Phoenix and the county is pretty good. You use a giblet to build stuff like that when a project doesn't really get the benefit when you provide that. So there's an example. This is my favorite phrase actually told to me. So that $26.8 million deal, the three towers, the three towers in 1999. The deal was being done because the guy who built, who developed the property, the flat dirt guy, who'd assembled it and gotten the entitlements, was selling it to the next buyer. And I went, this appraisal concept, giblets get appraised. What's the net present value of, of the reduction in property tax? The eight year abatement plus the tail. And at the time the towers were done on Town Lake, there was no end to the tail. And I think they got a 40 year giblet after the eight years. You do the math, do the net present value calculation. I don't care what discount number you put there to discount it to net present value, it's still a big number. Once that sale took place, the buyer paid the developer, the seller, for the net present value of the tax break. So on what planet is that money going into the value of the project to overcome costs? It just was an added cost on the sale. And taxpayers gave up the tax money, and the person who got it was the seller of the land. That's how that started and kept working for some time. And that, frankly, is, I gave you all of that. Here's one of the, here's the examples of why you all need to do what you do. Accountability in government is really tough, especially in elected officials, because by the time the problems show up, the people who caused them are gone. Here are two examples, Big Lean Dreams Ballpark. After years of controversy and legal battles, the massive Big Dreams Ballpark in Gilbert, once touted as Disneyland for athletes, shut its doors for repairs citing dangerous safety conditions. It's expected to reopen in 2019. Anybody heard it's opening yet? No. Uh, Phoenix enters deal to sell downtown Sheraton Hotel for big loss. You all saw that, and you're all in the middle of it. Here we are in downtown Phoenix. Phoenix has entered uh, into exclusive negotiations to sell the city-owned Sheraton Grand Phoenix downtown, the largest hotel uh, for $255 million. Does anybody know what the uh, actual loss to the city was on it? That's homework. So what does the community get? It does get, if it's done right. On Town Lake, I used a giblet to solve a problem we had. A building was going to get built, and next to it was property that had sort of been abandoned by everybody, including the city. We started using, the, started using it as the mayor's trick bag. They'd go out, so when developers say, you know, we need a giblet, for what? They could maybe overcome the argument, but the answer was, here's what we will do. That land next to your building, we wanted to build a park, but we don't have the money to do it. You build it, finish it out to our standards, and we'll pay you back using the giblet tax abatement. Your building gets built, the city, which is never really great at building anything other than water lines and sewer lines and some roads, but mostly we still contract that out, is not building a park. A private sector guy who knows what he's doing building buildings and park stuff, build it. Save money in the whole process, and we paid them the average cost of the cost of building. Do the same thing with parking. I don't actually tell people, I'll only give you the marginal cost of what it costs you to add another 100 spaces for us. What's your average cost of construction? You make money, but we save a bunch of money. Because the last time the city of Tempe built a parking garage on its own nickel, it's immediately east of City Hall, $24,000 a space. People get really tired of the city because I call it the garage mahal. Um, <laughs> we do get some cost savings, but in this stuff, you hold people accountable by making sure they're doing their job as taxpayers, as voters. Repeat players versus one-time experience. I'm always looking for somebody who's actually invested in the community. If they're doing more and more deals and keep doing stuff, they're not only figuring out how to do it well, I get to know them, I know what their numbers are, and they're not trying to get as much money out of us today because they're going to be gone. There are always, in up cycles, the pretenders who show up. Every city gets them. Folks who show up and they're going to get this deal done, they overpay for the real estate, they lose it in the downturn. We had a bunch of that in Tempe. And my job was, don't give them any money that encourages this bad behavior and make sure what they're proposing sets a stage for the next cycle. But what this stands for, and this is the hardest lesson for people in politics, and it is tragic. It's truly tragic on a human scale. FOM, you know what FOM is? Friend of the mayor. 
Everybody who gets elected to these offices thinks all these people who start showing up and sending them Christmas gifts and inviting them to parties, they're all their friends. And then the day they're out of office, their phone stops ringing and they don't get invited anymore. They don't get the Christmas cards. They don't get the free drinks and the breakfast and all of that stuff. Watch for that. It's tragic when it happens. And so you try not to mistake the friends of the mayor for the friends of Hugh Hall. Because I have the same friends I had when I was elected to office that I've got now. A whole lot of people in between. But making sure you don't mix that up means that you don't make a mistake about doing a favor for this friend, helping them on a deal to give them extra money, because they're my friend. They ain't your friend. They're there to get the money. Again, we know what they are. We're just dickering over the price. So we've got two issues left now. Turkin v. Gordon, or Gordon v. Turkin, uh, Turkin v. Gordon. You remember who Gordon is, right? Oh my God, see? Friend of the mayor versus friend of Phil Gordon, the mayor of the city of Phoenix. Got sued. They always love to put our names into the captions, even though we're not legally liable for anything. It could have been just as easy, Turkin v. Phoenix. But the goal is to put pressure on the elected officials to shame them into settling. So this was a Goldwater Institute lawsuit. There are two out there that are X v. Hallman. Even though I'm the guy who stopped all of this stuff, I got sued because our city gave $164,000 million, or $164, to the um, uh, 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 aquarium in Arizona Mills Mall. If you want to know that story, I'll tell it to you sometime. And the second was because of a tattoo parlor. And it was X v. Hallman because then they can also send that out to their fundraisers about how this mean, nasty Hugh Hallman is destroying a small family business, a tattoo parlor, send us checks. So my name was used for three years by Goldwater Institute to raise money for their legal team. Turkin v. Gordon, the same thing. And what that decision was, it was about City North. Y'all remember that? Yeah. It went on for a long time. The City of Phoenix gave a very large uh, abatement of property and sales taxes. As I recall, the number is about $100 million in that present value. And the argument was, if they didn't give that money to Nordstrom's or whoever it was, I don't remember which one, a needless markup, something like that. And the developer, they would never get this mall that would make the city piles and piles of money. The court actually has a decision that I would tell you shows that the Goldwater Institute lost. That's not what they say. They won, except the court decided two things. First, gee whiz, everybody relied on this thing, and everybody kind of thought these worked, so we're not going to reverse this deal. Well, if you're serious about that deal, you just lost, and the deal, the people in the deal won. And secondly, the court decided, people cited for this, the community must receive a direct public benefit. Meaning, if we give you $20 million, we've got to get a $20 million parking garage. That's not what the case says. What the case says is the lawyers did a bad job and did not put into the agreement all of the consideration the city was getting from the developer in exchange for $100 million. They think it says this, but the reality is, had the lawyers gone in and said, for the city, we're getting parking spaces, more money from this project than we would otherwise get in our tax base and make that list. That's called consideration. It's what you get in exchange for giving something up. I give you $10, you give me a car. Those are consideration and that's what contracts are based on. Offer acceptance and consideration exchanged. The city of Phoenix did a terrible job documenting in its contract with the city north folks exactly all the good stuff it was getting. So then in the legal arguments, they said, oh, and by the way, we're also getting this and this and this and this. And the court said, too late. If that were real consideration, you would have put it in the contract. You're just telling us that now to try to justify this behavior. So the court case put back in place exactly the law that was in place before it. The law is that the gift clause means a city can give away as much as it wants to, as long as it gets back, in its view, consideration equal to that. Pretty colors, good feelings, happiness. <laughs> now, it's not quite that bad, but literally, it's a matter of being a good document drafter. So now we have a new case. You all know about it, because it's only a few blocks away. Uh, this is the 
actual statement in the Constitution, government shall not ever give or loan its credit in the aid of or make any donation or grant or subsidy or otherwise to any individual association or corporation. So the government originally, arguably, couldn't make charitable contributions. Now, court cases have since clarified, no, 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 that doesn't count here. This is about railroads. When this state was formed, the railroads had been in business for about 50 or 60 years, and they were getting massive graft and lots of help from state governments. And our progressive states said, we are not going to allow that here, and they put into the Constitution, we're not doing that kind of stuff. And the court cases have fairly consistently interpreted that as, truly, you're not allowed to give stuff away. You've got to get real consideration. And over time, the Bailey's Break Shop case just added to it that you can take people's property, you just can't give it now to a private business. It's got to be for public use. Those two pieces together are probably the most important stuff that comes out of all of this. And the, the uh, case actually said, uh, will government receive consideration that is not so inequitable and unreasonable that it amounts to an abuse of discretion? That's a pretty low standard. <laughs> Put in your document everything you think you're getting, and it's got to look, you know, facially okay. Now we have the new case, Englehorn v. Stanton. Remember, got to do some fundraising. Guess who brought the case? Goldwater Institute. That's right. Good for you. Um, you get the stars. So Englehorn is a property only owner immediately adjacent to uh, this parcel here, and the city of Phoenix has provided a government property lease excise tax to the developer of a residential tower. The net present value, according to the Goldwater calculations, and I thumbnail it pretty close, it's uh, an abatement that adds up to about four million bucks, and then a reduction in value, because it's under the 2010 regime, it was done before January of 17, that gives them another reduced rate over time. And the total amount of that is net present value about eight and a half million dollars. So Goldwater is suing, saying, you can't do this, because you are getting nothing in consideration. And now they're testing whether or not, even though it's a statutory scheme, this, the legislature can't amend the, the state constitution. So is it the case that under the gift clause, you just can't give away the money if all you're claiming you're getting is a project built on property that's otherwise not been um, productive for us, and we're getting a really cool building in an area that we call slum and blight? It's going to be an interesting outcome here because they're trying some new arguments on the Goldwater side. The city lost its argument on gift clause already in, in that they didn't get a motion for summary judgment. They haven't lost, but uh, Goldwater said it's a gift clause violation, and the court said, eh, we don't know. The city said it's not a gift clause violation, and a summary judgment motion would say you win or lose, and they told the city you don't win on that. A gift clause argument is still good in this case, so that's probably the primary piece of that. So that's uh, the end of this. Here's what uh, the complaint says. Taxpayer support for a privately owned high-rise apartment complex for which the profits will inure completely to the benefit of private owners and investors does not constitute a public benefit. The city's motion said a tax abatement is not a tax credit, so it's not an expenditure. And the gift clause only limits government expenditures. So what their argument was in their motion was, it's not that this isn't true. But we're not actually spending government money. We don't violate the gift clause because we're not spending government money. Because not taking money from somebody is not the same thing as giving them money. The challenge they'll face, and this has not come up because the people in the cases are not sort of deep in the weeds on how this stuff operates, is this is how it operates. It's the Patrick Flynn model. Developer charges tenants, tenants pay developer, developer pays city, and city turns around and hands it back. If you don't have that flow, it's not nearly as capable of delivering the benefits that the developer needs or wants to have delivered. So I'm waiting to see how their final assessment of how those cash flows are supposed to work. Because if the developer never has to collect it and merely isn't paying it, it's a more interesting argument. But that's not how these have ever worked for the last 30 years. I think that's it. Thank you. Now I'm here for questions. If there's any time left, if you also have questions. Yeah. That first 
two part question. Did it get the eight year abatement? And number two, was it deemed uh, because it was a blighted area or a downtown area? Economic area. Uh, at the time, so there were two standards that one could give, a, give money under the giplet. Uh, yes, uh, the question was, did it get an eight-year abatement? The answer is yes, and it got a 40-year life on the tail to generate enough of the revenue to pay for all of the costs that the city, so in addition to the cleanup, I didn't want my city paying for water lines and sewer lines to service that project, so the developer built all the infrastructure that had to get to the property. They built all the roads that helped get people to the freeways and all of that, so we added everything up and said, what's that cost? That's what we got to pay, and so we set it based on that and some valuation issues. So yes, it was possible. They got the eight-year abatement, and it has a, a, an additional 32-year tail. Um, it was done under both, uh, well, it was really done under slum and blight. And if you see the photographs, I'm sorry, I just turned off my computer. I would, uh, maybe I didn't turn off my computer. Uh, hang on a second. I'll give you a sense of, uh, of that. I think I have that if you want to see it. Well, I probably waste of time. The photographs I took, uh, I went out on the site before voting on this thing and went around all of the acreage and took photographs. And the most stunning one was a 50-gallon drum of chemicals with a hazard sticker on it open top with rainwater having poured into it, sitting in a puddle about two feet deep on an old loading dock that had long been abandoned. That's the condition this stuff was in. And it was pretty frightening of, we had brought it into the city with no understanding that when you start peeling away the, the pretty lipstick on this thing, it was a mess. And so that's what generated it. Yes, sir. Um, I was surprised when the West Sixth Apartments in Tim Beatles Two Towers. Oh, I love this story. Uh, they're partially built. Uh, somebody else comes in, takes them over, they finish them. They bought them pretty cheap, and then after they're built, uh, and we put them in as a regular apartment, all of a sudden, come to find out, all of a sudden it's a giblet. Yeah. I mean, always what? Yes. It always was. So here's how this one worked. This was this is actually how I ended up getting elected mayor because I'm such a. Um, so he's talking about those two tall towers. One's 30 stories, the other's 22. The original plan was for two 22 story buildings. This is how politics works. I'm running for mayor of the city of Tempe. The council is rushing just in case I get elected to get this deal cut. And they give the developer $7.6 million in tax abatements. And I get that, and I make it a headline news, and the newspapers suddenly cover, why are we giving $7.6 or $7.8 million in tax abatements to a project to build these towers? There's no explanation of any of that. There's no justification for it. And by the next council meeting, they were under such heat and shelling that they reversed themselves and cut it down to a $3.2 million abatement. Now, it wasn't perfect, but I figured for the taxpayers, I just picked them up about four or four and a half million bucks, not bad. That's the fun part of the story. Well, the next part's the funner part of the story. Now I somehow get elected mayor of the city of Tempe, and I get a call from a lobbyist who says that the developers of these two towers would like to sit with me. Now, I'm really evil. Campaign finance is one of my passions about how we really kind of contaminate the system even when we don't mean to. People who shouldn't be giving money give money and it looks bad. So when I ran for council, uh, two weeks before a vote on the Brickyard, which is another big building in downtown Tempe that ASU now owns, the developer held a fundraiser for the council members and they took money from the developer two weeks before they voted to give them a $10 million deal. I just think that stinks. Even if they're not in anybody's pocket, it just looks bad. So that was a big issue. It was again this issue in uh, 2004. So I pulled my opponent's campaign finance records, and of course the developers had done what they were asked to do, give money to these people, including my opponent who's running for mayor. Big chunks. Maxed out, a bunch of people from the company. I made copies of these things. Said, absolutely, I'll meet with you. Happy to meet with you. Uh, oh, you want to have lunch? Terrific. We meet at uh, Z Tejas on, uh, on 6th Street. And they're sitting there in the booth with the lobbyist, and I come in, and I have these campaign finance reports. And my yellow pad, I always carry a yellow pad. And I set them on the table, open to the page, with their names highlighted and all the money. I never said a word about it. 
To this day, those guys insist and believe and remember that I pointed to it and shamed them. I didn't have to say a word. All of that was going on in their heads. Oh my God, the wrong guy got elected and he knows! And I said, let me start out to make it real clear. Yeah, I got elected mayor, but my job is to make the city as great as I can make it. You guys got your deal. I don't unwind deals. I'm a guy who respects contract. You got your deal. But you will eventually need something from the city. And when you do, you already understand what the price is going to be. And to the two developers say, $3.2 million? Exactly! <laughs> so when they came back in, that chimplet still existed. I wasn't going to take it out. They paid for it. And here's how they paid for it. They came back in and needed some help, but more importantly, it was going to be two 22-story towers. There were supposed to be four buildings built. By the time they were in construction on the first tower, it was clear the market was so hot, they wanted to go to 30 stories. And I said, absolutely, let me do the math on what your profit's going to be on eight stories, because now you don't have to buy the dirt. You're not putting in a new sewer line. It's just, you know, the marginal cost of the construction. And I need parking. My downtown is underparked. I've looked at your parking plan, and I'm laying out all the... If you added another hard, it was 100 parking spaces, you add 100 parking spaces here, I saw your construction contracts, you guys gave it to me, I did the math, here's what your average cost of construction for those parking is, $2.1 million, $21,000 a space in structured parking. And there were electrical equipment on top of the Butte, all the radio towers and stuff, said, when you get your 30-story tower, I want all that stuff moved off and put on the top of your building because I promised the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, and I'm good to my word, I find that a blight too, that's a sacred mountain to them, and if I can get that stuff off, that helps a neighbor who's very important to us, it's one of the reasons the city exists. And this neighborhood that's complaining about the fact that you're building two 22-story towers immediately south here will go nuts over getting an extra uh, eight floors, because gee, that's going to be another 40 people driving cars in downtown Tempe. Like, that makes a difference. And they are still concerned. We need traffic calming in their neighborhood so that they know that we're good to our word, that we're not going to have people driving south. Aside from the fact that I've already publicly testified, folks, you want people living in these towers because now they're north of you, and guess where their jobs are? Farther north. They're not going to drive south to go through your neighborhood just to go to their jobs. So all of that worked together, that was $400,000, and then we needed a quiet zone. So the railroad that had for a century been going back and forth through Tempe on the west side of Mill, honks its horn at every intersection, even at two o'clock in the morning, driving people nuts. The cost of a quiet zone to do all the infrastructure improvements was $250,000. Add it all up, guess how much it was? $3.2 million. And the nice thing was, they got their eight story, extra eight stories, we got the traffic calming, we got the, uh, the rail line cleaned up, we got the 100 parking spaces, we got the stuff moved off the top of the butte, it cost $800,000. All of that got paid for, but it was by a private sector developer who's much better at building structured parking. And their marginal cost for that parking was probably less than 22000 of space because they could figure out how to put it in without adding average cost. Uh, and, and having So those are the kinds of deals that got done and that's how that worked. So that's why, thank you for handling the paperwork on the giblet. Imagine, so the developers who built those buildings had almost $200 million in them. They sold, I think, for 60 and then got replenished. And I think the construction, reconstruction cost was about 30. So I think they ended up with about $90 million in it. They're worth now probably $200 million. Um, and what they have done is exactly what I'd hoped they would do. They brought people living into downtown who now go to the restaurants, go to the shops, help support those businesses, even in the downturn, because they live there. So every time Tempe would hit a bad economic cycle, the downtown just goes dark, because nobody lived there. There's nobody dependent on that economy. And now we built in some automatic economy that helps support it in downturns. So, other questions? You had enough. You get to go on a tour of Bank One Ballpark. Here's the most unusual feature of this ballpark, by the way. There are signs you will see that say, beware of flying objects leaving the field. They are all around the ballpark because people get hurt. A couple of thousand people or a thousand people a year are through Major League Baseball. Hit in the head, eyes, all that kind of stuff. So one of the ways to <coughs> avoid being sued is you put everybody on notice. Be watchful, observant, because there are flying objects coming out of this field. And the most interesting feature of those signs is 
because we are in an unusual universe in which we have to do these things. Braille. They are in Braille. <laughs> Thank you all very much.